A few things are happening today, Ayo. One of them being, I just want to get that, the rehabilitation of the schools in the SCT that's going to be flagging up today. It so happens that education is a major concern for uh, the government, and you've heard the president and everybody basically talk about the fact that education, education. So that's what they're going to be doing today, flagging up a rehabilitation of all FCT schools that will be happening today, Malquay. Indeed, uh, Nyota, there will also be a rearrangement. The courts will also be busy, as they have been uh, for a while now. Rearrangement of killers of the Imo monarch. Remember, there was a monarch that was murdered in Imo state. We understand that the killers have been apprehended and they have been, uh, or they have been arraigned in a court of law. And that arraignment goes on today. Ayo. Yes, uh, there's something very exciting happening in business, and that's the fact that the Naira has appreciated against the dollar for four consecutive days. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? How does that reflect on the price of what? Cement? Whatever it is. All of the details you get on Business Morning on Sunrise Daily at 10 o'clock this morning. Meantime, let's go to the papers, see what's happening. And we're starting out with the Vanguard newspaper. That story's out there again. Killings. Troops come by Elsa Delta Creeks for militant killer. Leader. Leader, rather. For militant leader. Demolition of buildings in Oklahoma continues. Senate Joint Committee holds meeting with service chiefs. Killing of soldiers inhuman. Devilish. IYC. Delta Assembly condemns killings. Calls for thorough investigation. CDD ask FG to address deteriorating civil military relations. Niger Delta host communities condemn killing one culprit brought to justice. Remind warring communities of OD sad experience. Robo youth urge FG to bring killers to book. Well, while we're urging the government to bring the killers to book, information sharing would also help. Go to Page five, you get more details of that story, and that's it from the Vanguard. Well, if you look at Daily Trust, they're focusing on insecurity as well, but a very interesting aspect of it, uh, news had come out that the NFIU had released uh, the names of some terrorism financiers. Uh, but what Daily Trust is reporting this morning says, controversy trails leaked list of terrorist financiers. NFIU disowns memo, that's what they are reporting, four of six indicted BDCs not registered with the CAC, so not registered with the company's, um, is it company's act now? Mm. Anyways, uh, look at this, last writer, case already in court, as according to government officials, so which is it? Is the NFIU disowning the list, or is it that these people are already being prosecuted, which is it? Uh, the details are on page three of the paper, but they also have a breakdown of terrorism financiers in Nigeria. That's what's on the front page for the infographics. 15 entities identified plus nine individuals, and amongst them are BBC's Rio de Change operators. That story is right there on the front page of Daily Trust. Lead story of the Guardian newspaper this morning. Uh, is about the federal government spending six trillion naira subsidy on unavailable electricity in 10 years. What does that mean? Well, the details you'll find on page six of the paper, and it details how much was spent on 20, in 2015, 2016, on until 2024, until between January and February in 2024. Other details you'll find on the inside pages, page six to be precise. 
Uh, the Nigerian Tribune is the next one, and they have that story about the killing of the soldiers. But just go to the top of the nameplate. Let's pick out the one there that has to do with ju the judiciary, talking about how much the CJN is going to be earning and the Supreme Court justices per month. If you go to, I think that will be page 8, you get more details. Other judges get review as NAS approves salary increment for the judiciary. That's it from the Tribune. I'm looking at Daily Times for you now, and Daily Times also has this salaries allowances for judicial office holders, CJN, to collect 5.3 million naira monthly as reps pass new bill. That's the story on the front page there. Other Supreme Court justices each to get 4.2 million naira monthly. I don't forget that before now, this matter of remuneration and, uh, will I say, Welfare has seen the ouster of the Chief Justice uh, when Justices of the Supreme Court wrote a letter, uh, you know, which was leaked to the public. I mean, that was a, a really scandalous time. But it does appear now that, you know, there is some improvement in that respect to the passage of this. Um, taking a look, and I think this is what the wages and wages, salaries and wages commission um, and RAMFAC too had tried to effect when they were doing a review. Mm. But, you know, people were very upset because they thought this was all about the executive, not knowing that this also included the judiciary and a non-review uh, could also jeopardize the welfare of judicial officers. But that has now been looked into and this is what we're saying. Salaries allowances for judi judicial office holders has now been increased mm. but that's the lead story on the front page of daily times well let's not forget the picture which is also depicting a situation which we'll be looking into uh, within a few minutes there was a fire in idumota yesterday in lagos and that's idumota market and we'll be talking to the dg of la sema in a bit um, about the incidents in lagos yesterday are you absolutely my okay, but um... <laughs> Just, just right quick go through these papers. The, this Nigeria newspaper has this one on its front page. Crisis worsens as NLC, Labour Party, fight dirty. Abure, corrupt and inefficient, must go, as according to Labour leadership. It's a show of rascality by Ajero, says Labour Party. That story is on page four of the paper this morning. Well... I don't know what you make of uh, that uh, headline beside the papers, the, beside the picture, uh, Nilta on uh, Mark Web. London home rent surged to over £2,000 per month. I imagine someone picking up the calculator to do the math. That's the lead, lead story of uh, this Nigeria today. And the one I have here next is the leadership newspaper, and this is what they lead with. Post-Petroleum Industry Act, operators exploiting gaps to under-declare crude output. The details of that story you'll find on page 4, but see the writers. Tinubu's executive orders will enhance implementation, as according to experts. Warm future of nation's oil sector depends on the PIA, the Petroleum Industry Act. That's it from the leadership. Well, compare that story with what you're seeing on the front page of Business Day, uh, which is also still focusing in on, on uh, the petroleum industry. It's interesting how uh, we started this morning uh, with the towers of the NNPC, NNPC Limited, <laughs> and two papers are focusing on that. Nigeria gets most payouts from Shell. Yeah, Shell since 2020. That's the lead story. Nigeria gets most payout from Shell in first since 2020. As the lead story is seen on the front page of Business Day. Ayo. Morning, Mark. Where is from the, that story that you took on the front page of the Daily Trust newspaper. It uh, talks about controversy trailing leaked list of terrorists uh, financiers. <laughs> NFIU disowns memo for of six indicted BDCs not registered you know the the what i find interesting about that particular story is that this is not the first time we're hearing names being mentioned um, so what is going to happen so now the list is out what is going to happen we hear these announcements uh, Marco, you must have heard quite a fair share in your time 
uh, as a broadcaster, Nilta, you have heard as well. And many newsmen read these things and that's all we do, read. And we try to follow up on these things and then that's it. So what happens next? Now that we know this, the list of uh, terrorists, financiers, what happens next? Also, we are aware of the fact that quite a number of Nigerians are in one captivity or the other now as a result of banditry and kidnapping and all. And we have also heard some people say they can go and speak with these um, uh, non-state actors, so to speak, on behalf of the federal government. In other words, what does that mean? We know where these people are. We know who they are. So what is holding us back from protecting, doing the very primary thing that the Constitution asks us to do as a government? That's a poser, and as Marco, as you usually say, big question that someone needs to take on head on. That's my uh, take on the front page of the Daily Trust today. Indeed, I, uh, just before we round up the papers, hey, Mark, but that matter about the increment of wages for mm -hmm. the judiciary, the, when, when news like that goes out, what the, the Nigerian, the average Nigerian would think, what about the minimum wage? Mm -hmm. Why does it take so long for a new minimum wage to, hit, to set in? But it's real quick for the, those in public office to increase their salaries and wages. That's, and that's, what, that's what they will say. That's what they'll say, that's but, that's, thinking, but that's, not the, entirely, I mean, that's not entirely true. Indeed, but again, when, that, when things like that happen, what, what, what goes on on the other side? Mm -hmm. These are some of the things that should be weighed as decisions are made, especially when it has to increment of salaries for anybody as far as they are serving this nation and they are all paying taxes. That's mm -hmm. my two comments. And I think it's just saying. important to reiterate um, and to emphasize the call that IO has already made uh, to the NFIU, especially looking at what is on the front page of Daily Trust this morning, uh, all saying that uh, the NFIU is disowning the documents. Uh, we need clarity and we need more transparency in terms, I mean, the NFIU is there to ensure that, you know, there are no backdoor dealings and to reduce, um, you know, let's say black money or dark money circulating within the, not just the Nigerian economy, but also from Nigeria to the outside world, because we know that they also get a lot of external cooperation. Um, what we're hoping to see is that when eventually these revelations are made, that they're done in a very transparent manner, that Nigerians are aware of the work that they're doing. We shouldn't be hearing or seeing documents leaked, and then, you know, there's no clarity. When we reach out to the NFIU, you know, we're not, we're not sure yet. People are angling, and they're you know, waiting to see if indeed the Nigerian government, as it has promised that it would several times, will eventually release the list of those who are behind some of our security woes in this country. It is very important. And what it also does is that it instills confidence in the people of Nigeria in the ability and the intention of its security agencies to be able to wrestle down terrorism. Indeed. And at this point in time, we would say that's a look. That's a end the look at some of the dailies. We'll draw real quick to um, talk to the Director General of the LASEMA, Dr. Okel Tolu, to give us an update on what, what happened at the market, the Dumata market, that fire incident. What's the situation now? Um, Dr. Okel Tolu, are you there? And they have power in how the solid material testing on the other two. But my team are on the ground. All the key first responders are on the ground since yesterday. Oh, okay, so it, it, can you just take us back? I, we missed that first part of what you were saying about the situation. What happened? Do we have an idea what caused the fire? How many buildings have been affected? Are there any casualties? Well, from the, um, from the information that was gathered yesterday, it was due to the upsurge of um, uh, electricity. And that is what leads to the incident. However, it affected four buildings. Out of these four buildings, two collapsed due to the impact of the inferno. Two are on distress now. So totally, it affected four, bu four buildings. 
The two that are in distress, we are going to carry out material testing to ascertain that they are fit. And if they are not fit, we are going to pull them to ground zero to ensure that there is no secondary disaster and to ensure safety in that area. How quickly would you say the responders uh, were on site? Because yesterday, when this fire broke out, immediately, I think some people already put it on social media, and we saw that it was just one building that was affected, and we saw people trying to put out the fire, and some people were even saying, oh, look, because oftentimes when uh, security, when uh, first respondents come, one of the things they say is, oh, if one of the traders had fire extinguisher. But by the time that one building was you know, ablaze, one of the things people were saying was, a fire extinguisher obviously cannot do very much here. So how quickly would you say that the first responders got to site? Okay. The, the good thing is that the incident occurred around 7.01 a.m. AM, and within 10 minutes, we all the first responders were on the ground. Now, you will look at it holistically that the response time is about 10 minutes. However, if you look at the impacts of the inferno, there are a lot of factors, both intrinsic and extrinsic factors, that's you that will be associated with that kind of disaster. So are you saying that the buildings, all four of them caught fire at once, or was it from no, one no, no, building no, 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 no. to the other? You see, now, when you look at the intrinsic factor, if you look at the contents of the, of the building, they, they, they are highly inflammable um, substances or materials that they put in, into that place. So you will discover that all the safety precautions are not put in, in there. And you can see that there is easy spread of, um, of this inferno from one building to another. In the emergency circle, we call it skipping of, 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 of fire. But however, because of the aggressiveness of the uh, of the emergency responders, we quickly localized it at, 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 at a point. Mm. So if I get you correctly, this fire started at in one building at about seven in the morning. Your responders yes. were there in 10 minutes, and but by that time it had already spread to four buildings. Is that what you're saying? Yes, it, it's keeping. Because of what, because of the storage, because of the material they use to build the, 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 the buildings. So, and because of what they store, they did not put what we call insulator in, in, in the building. You can see that there's easy spread of, 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 of fire from one building to another. Okay. So looking at where we're currently at, I mean, this is not the first uh, market fire that we're recording this year, sadly and unfortunately. Um, I'm just wondering whether, you know, awareness is increasing amongst traders, um, especially in market situations in Lagos State. It's not only Lagos that has this problem. I mean, a lot of states also have the problem here in Abuja. We've also seen recently a market fire in uh, Wuse, and part of what we're told is that the materials in the shops too contributed to it being uh, so big. But I'm just wondering, considering how frequently this is happening in Lagos, yes, the first responders are doing their best, uh, but would you say that there is a growing awareness of safety and, um, you know, yeah, safety procedures with regards to storage of materials and what needs to be done to prevent a fire and what should happen in the event that one happens? Okay, let's look at the lacuna now. The lacuna is straight that this government is doing their bit under the watch of Mr. Babaji Jolushala Sonwolu. All the agencies, the safety commissions, the local emergency management committee, the fire services are doing their bit. They are carrying out sensitization. People are seeing what is happening. But you see, the point is that the people are not keying in into it. That, oh, it, 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 the disaster would happen. That is the lacuna. That is the gap. People need to change their attitude. People need to change their orientation. The government cannot do it alone. In as much that we are putting a lot of things in place, the people have to abide with the rules and regulations. What, what, 
What precisely would you like to see the people change? What attitude bothers, bothers you the most as DG of last summer that you'd like to well, see the people change? In terms of the market, there must be easy accessibilities of the first responders out of our fire truck. They should ensure that their markets are well positioned. Not only that, when you are using inflammable um, substances or materials, you should build in your, your, your shops in so that there are, there are planted that are insulators that will prevent it from spreading from one place to another. And you see that some of them, Despite all the enlightenment, some of them still store diesel inside their, 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 their shops. Some of them still put, um, still put generators inside their shops. So these are the things that will militate the, the, the effectiveness and efficiency of putting out the compostable materials. All right, Dr. Tainitolu, I want to thank you so much for coming in this morning and giving us an update on what's happened yesterday and what needs to be done going forward. Dr. Okeo Tainitolu is the Director General of the Lagos State Emergency Management Agency. Thank you once again. Thank you. All right, Sunrise Daily, we'll be back in a moment to get into our conversation. We do, the news broke yesterday that the CBN tidied up all, manner, all matters around backlogs of foreign exchange demands or that had not been taken care of or requests. We'll look into that in a moment. Do stay with us. Imagine lovely meals you can cook with these ingredients. Mm. You spend heavily, but no guarantee of a mm. tasty meal. Not making a right choice of seasoning cube can oh. ruin your meal, money, and confidence. For a tasty meal, do not compromise. Choose gold. Use Terra Gold for the rich, consistent taste your loved ones crave for. Good for soups, stews, and jollof. Terra Gold. One cube, endless possibilities. Do you know that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only, you get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp, and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design, and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 0913 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. Heartburn and indigestion? Try Just Eat. My recommendation for the past 26 years, Just Eat. Reliable remedy for heartburn, indigestion, flatulence and acidity. In a world hungry for goodness. With a splash of golden terra oil, a mom can transform a frown into a smile. Make a lunch hour a happy hour. Change no thanks into yes please. Provide care when our nearest and dearest needs it most. And resolve family feuds without blowing a whistle. Providing tasty, nourishing family meals is all that matters. The world needs moms because where there are moms, there is hope, happiness, and love. Golden Terra Oil or Pure Love.
Thank you for staying with us. Well, the Central Bank of Nigeria announced that all valid forex backlogs have now been settled. And we understand that all of those claims uh, sum up to something in the region of $7 billion. Now, it leads to the questions around Nigeria's fiscal and monetary policies and how they affect, as we say, the price of bread. Marcelo Keke joins us this morning, as you have seen. He is a former chief economist with Zenith Bank. He joins us virtually from Lagos. Thanks for joining us this morning, Mr. Keke. Thank you very much for having me. Well, there are those who wonder exactly what is going on. So the CBN governor had said that part of the strategy for boosting the economy is to restore investor confidence by clearing this kind of backlog and all of that. Question, natural first question is, in your opinion, does this really do the job? Well, um, it's a, a good way to start. If, if they have done what he said they have done, the first thing is to say congratulations. The second thing is to now question the source or sources, you know, such a amount within so short a time, you know, with which they, are, no, which they applied to, you know, settling those uh, huge backlog, you know, forex uh, uh, indebtedness, if you like. Okay, so, but since he has told us, as the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, who have no reason to doubt him and to say congratulations that that has been done. It is one of the very critical initial steps that must be taken, you know, because it's like settling all the indebtedness. And so once that is settled, it can now start the new journey of moving forward, you know, without anything uh, 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 acting as an, an as albatross kind of holding them down. So we want to believe him. And um, talking about uh, confidence of investors or investor confidence restoration, it's a long journey, I must tell you. What he has done is just very first critical step of clearing the uh, outstanding uh, you know, backlog of uh, uh, forex uh, transactions. Uh, but going forward, there's still a lot to do. Because like I said, we don't know how the money they applied, you know, we are sourced. And still going forward, the challenge in the forex market is that of demand and supply. Uh, some of us have not seen a sustainable supply of uh, forex to the market, you know, in, in huge volumes to be able to stabilize the market as the authorities would expect and as prospective investors would expect. So, but having done what they have done so far, we have to wait and see. And that should be the position of investors also, to see whether the new situation or condition we're arriving at in terms of stability of the foreign exchange market and Naira appreciation against the dollar happening on a sustained and sustainable basis. Well, that no, is, that well, should be our position now. You know, naturally, some, someone is wondering how, in your opinion, is it relevant for Nigerians to know uh, the way or how the CBN was able to come up with the $7 billion? Uh, is it because we've been struggling with Forex availability over time? Why, why is it necessary for us to find out exactly where the source, what the source of that $7 billion that the CBN has cleared is? It is critically important, absolutely necessary, that the public should know because this government so far uh, has been having this, uh, you know, not having so much confidence of the investing public. And since the Naira was floated, you know, the challenge of uh, supplying Forex to the market, you know, to have an equilibrium of uh, demand and supply situation, that's, that's, what, that's what people are used to. So all of a sudden, um, the, the, the CBN comes up to say that the huge outstanding of uh, 7 billion has been settled. Then you begin to wonder where this money has come from. Don't forget that at various points, the CBN governor, the Minister of Finance have mentioned that they were going to uh, you know, take off some loans from here and there, here and there. You know, 
if the government is borrowing or any agency of government is borrowing, it is Nigeria that is borrowing. And so there should be nothing hidden about it. So if they borrowed from wherever to handle the situation they said they have handled, they should let the public know. Transparency is very, very important at every point in time in governance. And that will go a long way in uh, giving credibility to the current government and the leadership of the central bank in particular. So it's not, it's not, uh, nothing should be shrouded in secrecy. Nothing. So well, the earlier they let the public know the source or sources of the money, the better for them. And the more credible they will become, you know, with the policy they'll be coming on with going forward. Thank you. Okay. Well, there are those who would also wonder exactly whether that is of any significance, really, because there are... Inform there is information out there that even though businesses are some businesses are folding up in the country, there are businesses are also coming into the country. A number of uh, institutions are bringing their businesses back into into the country. I saw a video. I don't know if you saw the same video uh, at, the, at the parliament in Ghana, where one of the parliamentarians there was lamenting that a particular business that was doing well for the country is moving back to Nigeria, well, one multinational company, moving back it, a particular segment of its business back into Nigeria. Wouldn't you see that as some demonstration of restored confidence in Nigeria's economy? <laughs> well, thank you again for this question. Um, what, what you are saying is an isolated case. What we've been experiencing in Nigeria, you can even call it an exodus of uh, multinationals. How do you know now? I don't need to go and start mentioning that. The latest one is that uh, PZ Cousins that you know over the, over the decades in this economy wants to go. And the uh, Nigerian authorities, Securities and Exchange Commission and others, are putting some kind of hurdles on their way, you know, to having a smooth exit. You know, you know about Proto and Gambo, okay? You know about uh, uh, others in the pharmaceutical sector. You know about the uh, uh, major oil companies that are living in droves and so on and so forth. So let's not go into that. Now, you had one saying what you, you said they have said. Does not cancel the fact that our environment is not competitive. You understand? Because if you talk about even cost of uh, doing business in Nigeria, we are not competitive. Okay, that is one. And also when you look at the side of security or insecurity in the land, you then look at other conditions. You understand? So we know, and when you look at published, you know, data, statistics from the National Bureau of Statistics in terms of foreign direct investment inflow, as they are speaking, you now see that rather than going up, FDI has been going down, you know, in recent times, in recent years, in recent months. You know, in the past nine months, if you like, FDI has been going down, okay? And it is foreign direct investment that is at the core, you know, of what you can call, uh, I mean, what you can call real investment, okay? Um, yes, government has attracted some kind of foreign portfolio, portfolio investment, which is called hot money. It's hot money because it's hovering, hovering all over the place looking for higher returns, and Nigeria, when it doesn't offer higher return in terms of interest rate, you know, the money will move to uh, elsewhere. And you should also know that we've always had, we have for some time now had the challenge of when FPI, foreign portfolio investors come in or other investors come in, when they want to move out, we don't have the dollar for them to move out, for them to cash out. You understand? So has that been settled? If it had been settled, why would we be talking about $7 billion, you know, in our standing... Uh, backlog and so on and so forth. You are familiar with this case of uh, foreign airlines. You know, as we speak, nobody has even specifically addressed that issue to say whether it's among the 7 billion that be settled or is still outstanding. So you have those uh, cases. So when you talk about this one, somebody speaking from Ghana, it's an isolated case. But we pray that we begin to have more of that. That's what Nigeria needs now more than ever before. That's investment okay. inflow. Whether it's coming from Ghana, you know, or from wherever. We badly need investment inflow and so that production, reproduction and productivity will increase in this economy. And then the availability of, you know, the, their output will be here with us by way of handling inflation. Because when you have the necessary output here, 
in the uh, proper uh, volume and quantity. It will also, in a way, handle the issue of uh, inflation. Thank you. Well, you know, um, perhaps still on that particular matter, there are those who believe that these issues that you have mentioned very, very important, a risk to unemployment and a number of other things like that. And also the fact that uh, the, the invest, investment climate is quite a tough one in our country as at this moment. There are those who would say uh, Nigeria is not also an isolated case. Take the example of some data um, that was put out by... Uh, one of the officials of government saying that compared to the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria's announcement of 767 companies that shut down last year, uh, he also referenced the Small Business Advocacy Group in the UK saying that 345,000 business closures in the country was recorded, more businesses closing down uh, than starting up for the first time in 12 years. He also cited those in, the, in, in other countries like uh, India and in uh, China as well. In fact, those are in the region of 10,000, more, more than 10,000 businesses closing down for the first time in those countries, in those droves. So, yes, valid the, thing, the issues that are going on in the country. But there are those like you as well who have also said Nigeria is not an isolated case in this matter? Well, we may not be an isolated case, but every jurisdiction, every uh, country has its peculiarities. We have peculiarities in Nigeria. What are our challenges are not necessarily the challenges in those jurisdictions you mentioned. Incidentally, you did not mention, um, you know, uh, some of the developing countries, you know, talk about UK and all that. They are in their own, uh, you know, uh, at their own level. But coming to our own level as a country, you still have the challenge, serious challenge of infrastructure here. Infrastructure. Uh, we are told whether yesterday or two days ago that the president approved over 450 billion, you know, naira that will go into uh, handling the power sector problem. This has been there over the years. Talk about power. If the manufacturers tell you how much of their expenditure that goes into power, sourcing power, then you, you will know what you understand better what we are talking about. I don't think it's a power challenge that caused those uh, uh, companies in the UK you know, to, to, have, to have got out of business, to have shut down. You understand? In our own case, that's the situation. And then you come to multiplicity of taxation. Of ta yes, taxes in this country. It's, it may not be the same. In other clients, then you talk about the level of insecurity in Nigeria. It may not be the same in other clients. Then you talk about, you know, some other bottlenecks in the bureaucracy. You want to get this approval. You want to get this certification. You want to get that. You want to get that from the government, what you go through as a manufacturer or as a business person. At the end of the day, many people get frustrated in terms of seeking the approval from the appropriate government quarters. I don't have the data now to tell you, you know, some businesses that had to either leave this country or uh, the ones that wanted to come in, but because of this kind of situation, had to go back. Okay? Go and check what happened to Virgin Atlantic when it wanted to set up here in Nigeria. They had a terrible experience in terms of the bureaucracy. People up there, whether permanent secretaries, directors along the line, you know, the kind of conditions they were asking and that and that. At the end of the day, that company has to leave Nigeria frustrated. There are so many instances like that. So this is not exactly the, the same condition in those places you mentioned. So when businesses are shutting down here, are dying, or those who want to come in are not coming in, they know what they're talking about. Our condition here is terrible, you know? Our condition here is terrible. So it's not the same with the condition in the UK. For whatever reasons in the UK, yes, companies could be shutting down. But our condition here, we tell ourselves the truth. The environment is that we are not competitive. You understand? And that is why most of the items that are imported into this economy do better than the ones that are produced locally here. In terms of pricing, no matter how we try here to improve the quality and all that, but many products come into this country cheaper, uh, produced at cheaper costs where they are coming from. And so they have complete the local ones in terms of pricing. Well, Mr. Marcel, I think that indeed, you know, we can do so much more in terms of
terms of our ease of doing business, I mean, there's been how many government uh, committees and even a, a whole institution now put in place to try and ease um, you know, the way businesses work and, you know, I run here in Nigeria, but it looks like there is still so much work to be done. And you've talked about one of the impediments, which is power, uh, which, you know, at the end of the day makes a lot of the goods that we produce here rather un un uncompetitive. Uh, but as I was saying in terms of, you know, global context and also local context, you've talked about um, FDIs and how, you know, we we've seen a decline now over the years. But we've been, there's been a prediction that FDI should increase this year. Uh, there was a drop from 2022 to 2023, uh, I think by as much as 26 or 27 percent. But that there's a prediction that it should increase this year. And so far, so good. Even in the manufacturing sector, it does appear that we're seeing an increase. Um, it's been reported, that I think it went up to $1.5 billion uh, dollars in the first quarter of 2024 by as much as $644 million. Uh, that is what uh, the National Bureau of Statistics has reported so far. Now, how that is going to be sustained is also is not clear. Uh, we don't know, you know whether we have enough you know, firepower to keep it going, but it certainly you know, should inspire some confidence. What I want to take you up on, and because you've also talked about how you know, the, the CBN needs to be more transparent in terms of how it has met up this $7 billion backlog. And, and it doesn't seem like it met up all the $7 billion because what we understand is that those that were valid, those who had concrete evidence and, you know, whose claims were valid, they attended to. Those whose zones were not so valid, they have referred to the security agencies for more scrutiny. We do not know what vo volume of that has been referred and what volume of that has been cleared. But what I want to bring up is the fact that the dollar or the Naira seems to have appreciated a great deal significantly against the dollar uh, for the last couple of days. Um, uh, from what we gather now at the parallel market, it's been around 1,500 Naira or so from a low of about 1,900, approaching almost 2,000 Naira. Do you think that these two statements will then tally, given what it is that the CBN has said and what people are experiencing um, on this market. I don't know what it's like at the, is it here and X window or so, uh, but the parallel market is what we are able to, you know, immediately, immediately see. From what you see in those other markets, the official windows, would you say that what they're, what they're seeing there is tallying with some of the things that the central bank is saying? Um... I may not have the statistics you have, or you are referring to, but the truth is that the challenge we have in the foreign exchange market, where we are told the forces of demand and supply determines the exchange rate, is the, is the point that there is so much demand. You understand? And so there is also the problem of scarcity, inadequacy of supply. So all of a sudden, the Central Bank of Nigeria tells us that they have been able to clear backlog. And that's why we are curious. We want to know. And they are, they are telling us exactly where that money comes from. We do them a lot of good. And we do the Nigerian economy a lot of good. You understand? Then, on the other hand, as to the appreciation in the past few days of the Naira, um, for the Naira to have crashed, you know, being on a third spin, so to speak, in the past nine months, and got into, like you said, up to or close to two 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 thousand naira to one dollar. I mean, it's a serious cause for worry. So, if it has not appreciated to one thousand five hundred, one thousand six hundred, it's not yet cause for celebration. We rather have to keep our fingers crossed and keep praying that it keeps coming down, because we know where we were as at end May 2023, and where we are now. And the havoc, the volatility has caused this economy, you know, at individual, family, and business and government levels, you know. So it's too early for, un, for anybody to begin to celebrate when an era comes to 1,500, 1,600, and all that. And that's why we're talking about sustainability in terms of supply increasing the volume of forex you know being supplied to the market 
okay, or coming up with policies that will deal with some frivolous demands if those demands are discovered. But the truth is that the CBN, you know, and other agencies should do more to discover those who are really posing a problem to this economy. Like the binances of this world that were discovered by the CBN recently. There are others like that. So more of them should be discovered and dealt with. You understand? Either properly, officially regulated properly, and the activities checked and supervised. You understand? So when that is done, you know, all those uh, illegal or harmful practices or bad practices in the forest market would have been handled. And then we have a decent, you know, stable market. If it's stabilizing at 1,500, we don't know. So that businesses will have confidence to know that when they are planning, look at what we are planning with. Mm. If it comes down to uh, now 1,000, we will all know, you know, not this one that is moving like a yo-yo. Like you said, in the past two days, it will do as if it's appreciating. In the next few days, it will be as if it's collapsing and all that. Nobody likes such a situation. Not even businesses, not even individuals. Mm. So we hope. We hope the Nara will consistently begin to strengthen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kika. What I would also like to, I mean, we know that in the next couple of days or so, uh, sometime between March 26th or uh, March 25th and 26th, the central bank is due to have another monetary policy committee meeting. And we're looking forward to another brief uh, by the CBN governor. Maybe there will be, um, you know, some talk about how the federal government or how the CBN has been able to meet this backlog. But I think that it's, it's, it's really important that you have underscored your call uh, for transparency. However, the question I was posing was that given what we're currently seeing in the market, given some of the things that we're seeing, can we take that as a proof that indeed perhaps maybe is as a result of that we're seeing the Naira appreciate against the dollar? Uh, we... Can we may not attribute the appreciation of the naira against the dollar to the monetary policies taken by the central bank so far? We may not, and that is why it is very very important that the central bank itself makes public, you know, the source or sources, you know, from where the money came, for it to have cleared the backlog. You understand? Rather than the, the, the policies, uh, monetary policies in recent time, helping to clear it, 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 it kind of created more problems. You know? Because if you look at uh, monetary policy rates, for example, being moved up by 400 basis points, that has never happened in this economy. It has never happened. From 18.75 to 22.75, you understand? It's an indicative rate. And it now told the deposit money banks, move up your interest rate to 30% plus. When you look at that, which kind of businesses, businesses that are legal, will function and survive when they take uh, loans at over 30% from commercial banks? You know? And should any business bother to take that? That's part of, that's part of the competitiveness we are talking about in this economy. If you, if you must recognize it, that kind of level of interest rate. If you're a business and you take loan at that rate, by the time you factor that cost of fund into your production, you understand, and you finish producing and supply to the consumer, the commodity or the goods, items coming out, coming in from outside, the imported one, will definitely outcompete you. If you factor that, it's part of the inflation we're talking about. That is cost push inflation. inflation. The cost of doing business here would have, you know, pushed through the roof so that the ultimate consumer will be in a position to suffer this kind of situation of high prices of everything. That is what that policy will reflect mm. in. But and the other one of CRR, you know, uh, cash uh, reserve ratio, being raised to 45%, is also counterproductive because what it means is that the money that should have been left to the banks for them to lend out to businesses, you understand? and other, uh, you know, economic agent. They are now constrained because if somebody deposits 1,000, for example, with a bank, it means 45% of that should be left with the Central Bank of Nigeria. Oh, 
Oh, Mr. KK, what I want so to How much are they left with to, to do business, to lend out to the public? Those are other aspects, I mean, of the monetary policy. I mean, usually when the CBN governor briefs, he talks about that which is the key issue and also talks about Forex, which is what we're talking about. The fact that if central bank has been able to clear Forex demand, I mean, that certainly should reduce pressure on people who are looking for Forex to be able to do one thing or the other. That's, I think that's the question I was asking you. But since you've already gone to monetary policy, you know... If I what, must answer you, if I must answer you, if I must answer you that, yeah, that but, is clear that law, that but, is clear the backlog, yes. does not in any way, does not in any way reduce the pressure. Because okay. the, just like the name says, backlog, that is something done in the past, you understand? So it doesn't have any correct impact. That, that is why transparency should be the name of the game. So that is why they should tell us where they got the money from. And the earlier they do that, the better for them. So that there should be credibility. You know, it's not the voodoo business. Okay. You understand? It shouldn't be carried in any situation. Thank you. Okay, now that we've gone to NPR, also looking at, you know, what it is that the central bank governor did say in the last briefing about how much, you know, was now in the economy. And I think a lot, number of people have also been uh, monitoring mm -hmm. the amount of cash that has been released to the economy. Uh, what tools would you have suggested that the central bank use? Because, I mean, the CBN governor, we are still, I think the Senate now has set up a committee to investigate the 30 trillion naira given in ways and means. And the central bank governor also said another 10 trillion naira was given in interventions by the central bank. Uh, all of it coming to about 40 trillion naira released into the Nigerian economy over a period of a year or so. What tools, would, uh, which some people say is exactly what has caused the inflation that we're witnessing right now, what tools would you have suggested are available to the central bank for it to be able to control, you know, what is inflation that seems to be running away with the wind? Thank you very much for this question. Let me tell you that when you look at inflation, there are so many, so many factors that are responsible for the hyperinflationary trend we have in Nigeria. So many factors. And it's the Central Bank of Nigeria, in all honesty, is not in a position to single-handedly, you know, tame or tackle inflation. It would be foolhardy for them to be thinking like that. You understand? So the, the physical side, which is the government, must be working in tandem with the central bank, with the monetary authorities, you know, for inflation to be effectively, effectively tackled. But that seems not to be the situation now. So it's not a question of two. The central bank, I must tell you, is handicapped. It has limited tools, you know, with which to tackle inflation. I have told you how they raised the NPR by 400 basis points to uh, 22.75. Wait and see the impact of that. And I have told you that that has now raised interest lending rates by commercial banks to, to, through the roof, if you like, and making uh, funds unavailable to, you know, the investing public or businesses. You understand? So will, will the central bank go again at another monetary policy committee meeting and continue to raise the NPR from 22.75 now, maybe to 25 and up and up? No, 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 no. That will not fight. That will not effectively fight inflation. Okay. You understand? Mr. So that is why it, there, is need, there is need for it to collaborate. It's like it's working in silo. It's working alone. You understand? And that's why it's always, it's always, we, are, we will always be asking what, what is the overarching plan of the government, you know, regarding every aspect of the economy. Mm. Not the Central Bank of Nigeria will be doing its work on one side and the uh, fiscal authorities will be doing another thing on the other side. Mm. As a matter of fact, some fiscal policies do act as counterpoints. You know, okay, because we're we're almost out of time here. You, you, I was going to ask you this question about um, yes, you mentioned this about the second or third time you talked about the CBN working in 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 isolation, sort of working at, in it, working in silos. I was going to ask you what should be the way forward now, seeing that the fiscal policy and monetary policy needs to come together to be able to move Nigeria. Nigeria's economy forward. If we go by what the, the CBN uh, was quoted in their statement, saying that all they've done so far is to seek to restore confidence in the Nigerian economy, seek to restore confidence that Nigeria is able to meet up with all of its forex demands, as the case may be. What should be done now or going forward? What kind of policies should we be looking at to see the economy moving on, this, on the right track? 
thank you. The kind of policy we want to see, one, is that the government should decisively, decisively deal with insecurity. That is one. Two, is that the problem of foreign exchange is as a result of inadequacies of supply. And that the mainstay of this economy, everybody knows at this point in time, is oil. And so government should do everything, everything humanly possible to secure that sector and make sure that we maximize whatever we can get from oil. That is still the mainstay of the economy. But as we speak, the oil sector is beleaguered. The oil sector is endangered, kind of. You understand? And that is why for quite some time now, we have been unable to improve significantly our production and therefore export and sell. What, what is the meaning of uh, oil, crude oil theft? Crude oil theft. The former president the other day told us that about 80% of what is produced is still being stolen. Obasa just said so, President Olusegun Obasa just said so. You know, it's in the public space. So if 80% of what is produced is stolen, what are you exporting? 20%? And what are you making from that? Okay, what else is, is to be exported for us to make a, a forex, you know, to bring to the market? And that is why we are saying that the CDA should be more transparent to tell us how it came across uh, 7 billion or whatever to defray the, the backlog and all that. It's very important because we are still worried by what is happening in the oil sector, you know? So let me stop here. Well, Mr. Master, okay, okay, I know that this conversation is an ongoing one. As long as our economy is where it is, we certainly will be needing your analysis. Thank you so much for coming on this morning. We've been speaking with Mr. Master Lokeke, a former chief economist for Zenith Bank. Thank you so much for joining thank you, us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Huh? Well, there is so much thank more business to come your way, as Ine will be talking about what has happened with the Naira against the dollar um, in just about 10 o'clock, about now. Ini, what exactly is going on and what do you have for us? Well, Mark, well, for a change, we should have smiles on our faces this morning because uh, for four consecutive trading days now, the Naira has been gaining. Yesterday was the biggest of the gains in those four days. So please, let's have a smile on our face and maybe a little bit of applause to the CBN uh, because the efforts they've been putting in, in uh, reshaping and giving more value or helping the Naira recover its value uh, seems to be bearing fruit. We do hope it's sustained at uh, 1,200 uh, is what Goldman Sachs said. But I, I guess that even that is going to be harsh for the economy. But let's see how far that will go. Good morning. Welcome to Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. Uh, we start, as usual, from the global space, telling you what's happening with oil prices this morning. We can tell you that it's rebounded on Thursday as U.S. crude and gasoline stock drawdowns lend support despite signs that the U.S. Federal Reserve may keep interest rates higher for longer. But, you know, now the projection is for June. They'll start cutting rates. Yesterday, they held. But let's look at the numbers now for Brent. We say we've, we've hit $86. This, by the way, should be good for Nigeria because the benchmark for Nigeria's budget is about $77 uh, for a barrel. So we have extra almost $10. Uh, at least eight for now. Uh, if that really comes into the pulse of the, of the, of the economy, uh, you know what that means for us. It means more FX, more revenue for projects, more boost to the Naira, and that, of course, is to everybody's good. So $86.41 after gaining 0.5% uh, this morning for Brent's WTI for the United States, also on uh, that bullish trend, $81.65 after gaining 0.5%. Uh, stockpiles are the major drivers of oil prices this morning. It fell as exports rose and refiners continue to increase activity. Gasoline inventories fell for a seventh week, down 3.3 million barrels to 230.8, um, and suggesting steady, strong fuel demand. More demand, obviously, higher the price, especially when the supply does not match the demand inventory numbers gave some support to the market as I drifted lower the day before. And yesterday, obviously, the United States held rate, the Federal Reserve held rate, its interest rate, giving hope that by June they will start cutting rates, which should boost more demand even more and put more pressure or more demand 
on, on oil. Now we go to the global grain space. Chicago soybeans rose for a second session on Thursday to hit a two-month high as excessive rains in Argentina raised worries over supplies and triggered short covering, which rose for a third session in four. Let's look at the numbers. Uh, a bushel, half a bushel of wheat is now $5.50 after it gained one full percent. Almost one percent is what soybeans gained at $12.20. Uh, we know that this uh, soybeans for about two weeks was hovering around $11. And uh, now we see it's $12 for three quarters of a bushel, while corn gained even more than 1% at $4.44 for three quarters of a bushel. Now, the factors driving this, uh, that rain we talked about over key grain regions of Argentina could be damaging. And so we see it's uh, a threat to supply, and so it makes the price to a soar to, and then in South American, uh, current soybean and corn crops could dent production. And then a Grain Trade Association and on Wednesday said that it cuts its forecast for this year's soft wheat outputs in the European Union and Britain by 5.4 million metric tons. We come back home to the Central Bank of Nigeria where they announced that all valid foreign exchange backlogs have been settled, fulfilling a key pledge of the current uh, administration led by Mr. Laemi Kadoso to process an inherited backlog of 7 billion U.S. dollars claims. Uh, please note this is the valid ones that have been uh, taken care of. And this, of course, was uh, disclosed by the bank's acting director of corporate communication, Mrs. Hakama Sidi Ali, in Abuja. She notes that the CBN recently concluded the payment of $1.5 billion to settle obligations to bank customers, effectively settling the residual balance of the FX backlog. She also disclosed that independent auditors from Deloitte Consulting meticulously assessed these transactions, ensuring that only legitimate claims were honored. Well, closely related to that is that good news we talked about uh, just at the beginning of the program that FX market traded. Uh, it was mixed, but we saw a lot of positives when we look at the slide, if we could have right there. Uh, we saw that the Naira did gain yesterday. Uh, it closed at 1,429 Naira, 61 Kobo. We haven't seen that in a while after appreciating adding 67 Naira 96 Kobo from the previous day's level. Nafex also appreciated 46 Naira 71 Kobo on one day. That's good. 1,536 Naira at the close of uh, trade yesterday. So we see a Naira hovering now between 1,429 and 1,536. Uh, not a place to relax yet, but at least we have to celebrate our small wins and hope that if this trend continues, we might get to uh, a fair value of the Naira. And uh, yesterday, uh, it's not just about the Naira. We did, uh, well, I did attend a session, a summit of chief executive officers. Did you know that there needs to be uh, a good relationship between the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer? These are two individuals who have an overhead view of organizations. And if any organization must move forward, there has to be strong synergy between both of them. Well, this is what I gleaned from that report. Financial reporting. Chief and executive officers and, and chief financial chief. officers are the major participants at the Lagos Business School CEO Leadership Summit. The essence is to explore the changes which have been effected in the roles and responsibilities of CFOs and build a strong synergy with their CEOs. The role of CFO has evolved beyond what it used to be from financial stewardship to becoming strategic partners and drivers of sustainable growth. It is important in our roles as well to be an active participant of transformation initiatives, right? Because of our vantage position, it is important for CFOs to leverage the helicopter view of the organization. You know, we see everything in the organization. 
ensure we plan those quite well. The executives understand the change in the roles and the necessity to embrace them. In our business, we think of a CEO as a chief entrepreneurial risk-taking officer. So chief risk-taking officer and the CFO as the chief risk management officer in the sense that generally the CEO is trying to take you over the cliff and there's a CFO who's trying to make sure that you don't you don't get to the cliff and you know is is stopping you but that's not alluding to numbers numbers are a lagging indicator in any business you know by the time you're looking at numbers the damage in any business has has been done and for anyone to play a role in actually helping to maintain numbers they need to be at the point at which decisions are made that affect numbers the ceo's key strategist the ceo keys executioner because what Olo said is spot on strategy beautiful nice 10 percent of the time 90 percent is an execution lessons shared here are useful to even small businesses the first thing for small businesses is you need the right skill to ensure that your business is first able to survive and then able to compete and grow. The CEO uh, is the flagship leader. We know that. But the CEO requires knowledgeable team members at the C-suit level, at the leadership level. Uh, the CFO has unique skills. But the CFO increasingly is there to share in the visioning the strategizing for a small business. What is the path to becoming a bigger, sustainable business? And they are using them to make business decisions. Lagos uh, Business School plans to share similar strategies uh, annually like as its contribution to boost economic activities in the real sector. Ini John Mekwa, Channels Television News. Financial information. Now this is more like it, right? We want the best quality ingredients when we cook. But when it comes to salt, we care less. We say salt is salt. Well, I care about my salt. It goes into my food and my body. So I use Dangote salt. Dangote salt is high quality salt that is refined and iodized to give great taste to my meals and also to support my family's health and well-being. It's time to care about your salt. Still watching business morning on sunrise daily now let's talk about the naira that's appreciation uh it's been on for four days now i guess it's time to hope a bit that it's come to stay let's hear what dr adisola sumoni senior analyst with financial derivatives company has to say hi uh dr sumoni good morning and thank you for your time this morning good morning Amy. thank you for having me on the show yeah so we've had uh, appreciation on the naira uh, since friday up till yesterday do you has, has this come to stay? Do you see this? Uh, I think the answer to that would be to maintain a wait and see approach. We don't know yet. Obviously, we are uh, a little bit optimistic uh, that it comes to stay. But again, it's 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 not random. It's driven by a host of factors, right? One of them is the pain of the backlog. Just yesterday, the central bank announced that it had completed pain. The backlogs, verifiable backlogs of around seven billion US dollars. I think that is huge. That is positive, and that has flooded the markets with some positive sentiment. And good, uh, it's also a very, very positive uh, signal that, for, especially for for foreign investors whose money has been, for lack of a better word, stuck in 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 Nigeria for 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 years. So I think that is positive, and that is part of why we are seeing a uh, denial gain against the US dollar. Another one is uh, uh, on the back of the hike in uh, benchmark interest rates at the last meeting uh, in February. We know from economics that higher prices uh, reduces the quantity demanded. And that's part of what we are seeing with the, with the hike in, in benchmark interest rates by around 400 uh, basis points. It kind of increased the cost of capital, thereby uh, uh, um, reducing the demand uh, for U.S. dollars. In addition to that, the, the, the hike in benchmark interest rates also signaled also attracted 
you know, foreign portfolio uh, investors, together with the portfolio of, or the, together with the cocktail of uh, measures implemented by the central bank, all of which have been viewed favorably by, by market watchers, by foreign investors, as well as domestic investors. And what is happening is that we are seeing an inflow of, of foreign portfolio investors. Also, we are seeing an inflow of remittances into the into the economy. Last year, remittances to Nigeria was around 20, 20 billion uh, US dollars. So bringing all of those together, we, we that's part of why we are seeing uh, the Naira uh, strengthening at this time. Another meeting next week. Uh, some people expect that there will be another hike. So do we say we're on the right track? If we continue on this track, then we might at least get a fair value of the Naira? Indeed, right now, uh, I think the Naira is in the state where we call price discovery, right? Trying to find uh, the fair value of the Naira. Still on the, on the meeting, I, FDC, we believe that uh, the central bank would increase benchmark interest rates by around 100 basis points or around 150 basis points at the next meeting. And the reason is very simple. It's twofold, really. One is to still, again, increase further, tighten further, uh, 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 increase further the cost of capital thereby reducing the pressure on the exchange rate. But secondly, and more importantly, is to anchor inflation. Like I mentioned, for in February, inflation we know has reached like a 20-something year high of 31.7%, uh, right? And so at this point, we need more tightening. Actually, at the last meeting, the central bank governor preferred to tighten more by around 425 basis points uh, compared to the 400 basis points. So I think we're going to see some more tightening, and I think it will be positive. It is it is being viewed positively or favorably by, by, by market watchers as, as well as international investors. We are seeing inflows just last month, uh, just this month, I beg your pardon, around last week we saw uh, more inflows into the into the cent into the uh, FX reserves a month on month by almost a billion US dollars, driven mainly again by foreign portfolio investments and remittances. So I think it is positive. I think the central bank is going to increase uh, our benchmark interest rates, and I think we should continue to see strengthening um, in the naira. All right. I'm talking about inflation now. What's happening to domestic uh, commodities prices? At this point, domestic commodities prices are still uh, more, mainly mixed. But uh, uh, we still have prices through the roof, for lack of a better word. We've seen the price of sugar up 100%, uh, about 102%, I beg your pardon, month on month to 85,000 naira. We've seen the price of cement up around 67%. A bag of cement that is to 9,500. We've seen also the bag of flour up, 50 kg bag of flour up 30% to 60,000 60, naira. For some agricultural commodities like tomatoes and peppers, you see those ones trend downwards by around 14% and 12% uh, respectively to 30,000 and 75,000 respectively. And it's also important to know that you know the food inflation is also quite high and it is still sticky downwards. Currently, it's around 34%. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Adesola Sumoni, a senior analyst with Financial Derivatives Company, for sharing those information with us. Thank you for having me. Let's take a break. We'll be back.
Welcome back to watching Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. We now head to, well, Foundation, Tony Lumelu, quite popular, I must say. Uh, it's one of those uh, leading philanthropy, empowering African entrepreneurs in the country. Uh, they announced 1,200 African entrepreneurs across 54 African countries as beneficiary of its flagship entrepreneurship program. The announcements will be made in a couple of days. Uh, tomorrow, in fact, March the 22nd. Uh, the new beneficiaries will become the 10th cohort of a 10-year-long TEF entrepreneurship program. So far, Tony Lumuli Foundation has given out $100,000 million. Well, let's find out the details of this with the co-founder of the foundation, Dr. Awele Lumelu, a co-founder, obviously, but also she also has own um, professionalism in the health sector. But let's focus on the foundation this morning. Uh, Dr. Lumelu, thank you so much for your time this morning and congratulations. Ten years. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me here. And thank you very much. Yes, indeed. It's been 10 years since we embarked on that flagship program of the Tenure Limelu Foundation. Mm. So, so you've given out about $100 million. If you were the government now, if you're in the public sector, we'll be asking for your books. Where did you put it? <laughs> who are the people who have uh, been touched, you know, with this? But we did see a lot of uh, documentaries that you put up. Uh, we see the youth, we see how they go through the trainings and all of that. Give us a little bit of background about the work you have done in this past 10 years. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll give a bit of a background. Actually, the, the Tony Elumelu Foundation started in 2010, where my husband and I decided to set this up in a bid to empower young African entrepreneurs. And this is because we saw that this is a sure way to develop the country and the continent at large. And then what we, we felt that it was important that we, as we like to say, that we democratize luck. And that's why this, we set up this foundation. Now come 2015, we embarked on the flagship program, which you refer to, the Tony Elumelu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program. And what this is, is it's a 10-year commitment. It's a $10 million commitment to fund, to train, to mentor young African men and women. So this was set up 10 years ago. This is now the 10th year that we're going into this. And um, what, what has even happened now is that come 10 years later, we've been able to fund 20,000 entrepreneurs. And um, I mean, I, I can go into this a bit later, but what, this has more or less been through the partnerships we've had, the excellent partnerships that we've been able to develop. And in addition to funding these 20,000 entrepreneurs. We've even gone further to train more than that number because we have this digital platform, which we call the TEF Connect. And what this is, is even though we fund, with commitment was to fund a total of 10,000 entrepreneurs, even though now 20,000 through our um, partners, we've been able to train through our digital platform up to over a million, in fact, over one and a half million and this has been amazing because even through this platform, they've been able to form sustainable connections. They've been able to be exposed to different partnerships, global partnerships, and lifelong um, um, experiences. And they've been able to scale their businesses through the connections that they've been able to make through this platform. And all these businesses, we've continued to monitor them. They've all been able to go on to impact their societies, to impact their environments, to employ more and more people to train and develop more and more people in their own circles. And so that's um, basically what we've been able to do with the foundation and in particular with the entrepreneurship program. Yeah, so I guess uh, with your influence, you have bias for women. About 60% of the businesses that you have empowered, uh, women run. So um, why women? Oh, we are trying to close the inequality gap. And how far have you gone you know, from your own space doing that? It's, it's, even, it's a good thing, as we all know, this is, I mean, this month has been all about women. We've had the International Women's Day. We've had the Mother's Day in some of our countries. So this, it's a key thing. The whole world is recognizing the importance of empowering women because, as we know, if we empower a woman, we empower an entire community. And um, at the Tony Animal Foundation, we in particular, we're very, we make a conscious effort to engage women, to empower women. When we started this program, there were very few women, we had less. We always remember that we had less than 20% of women, but we went out of our way to ensure that we attracted more women to be able to empower more women. And now we're proud to say we have 
over 40 percent of women approaching 50 half of our entrepreneurs are usually women and these women have gone on to do amazing things they've gone on to we've empowered them so they've been able to empower other people and they themselves have been able to create bigger businesses for themselves we we like we like to be able to do this because um it's very important it's very important that women are empowered but we also know that governments are important organizations are important so we've also in, in, in addition to doing what we do we make sure that we engage organizations we engage governments to be able to continue to come to create these um, enabling environments not just for the entrepreneurs but also for women entrepreneurs mm. so um, fact, i can even talk about something there's something we even have at the foundation yeah we set up a partnership with some other, with some of our good partners, and it's called the We for A. So it's Women Entrepreneurship for Africa. And this is something we set up, and women through this have been able to get funding. I mean, there's a particular woman I remember, I think she's from Nigeria called Sophia, and she she got 10,000 euros, you know, alongside other, about 120 other women, alumni. So this even goes, you know, there's so many things. These are, are, are entrepreneurs who have become alumni because we constantly monitor even those who've been through us. We have a strong alumni association. We continue to try to provide support for them. And so this is something we did for our alumni, those who had actually gone through the program. And she was able to, she alongside other, about 120 other women, was able to get 10,000 euros to scale her business, to grow her business. So because we believe so much in entrepreneurs, we believe so much in empowering women. Mm. And that's why we continue to do the things we do. Very, very interesting. But I, I just want to ask uh, that apart from the women and apart from the funding, I know you do do training and all of that, but how far do you go? You just said you, you work with alumni also. That's, that's very interesting because sometimes people get the funding and, you know, somewhere along the line, they just miss it. How far do you go with these businesses for sustenance? When we have this, so we have the program which they all everybody goes on to, not only those who get the funding, we have a structured business training program, which has actually been likened to like a mini um, MBA program. So the, 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 the entrepreneurs, as well as all those who have applied, go through this structured program for weeks. It was 12 weeks. I think we now do it about 10 weeks. They go through this structured program and we make sure they're trained. Their businesses are looked at. Their business plans are developed. They're handheld every step of the way. There are a number of them have even said, yes, the funding is important, but they found this training, some would say more important, more, more impactful than the funding that they've gotten. So we do this. And in addition to this, we also have our mentorship. We've, have, we've had amazing mentors over the years, people who have devoted their time. And this is one way in which everyone can help. They've come on board. They've helped to handhold these entrepreneurs they're with them even beyond this few weeks of the formal training. And these are mentors in different sectors. So we do the formal training. We have the mentors, a strong mentorship program, which continues to help to develop and grow our entrepreneurs. Mm, so when you, it sounds like you, you are calling for mentors, but who can be a mentor and who can be a mentee? You call for your programs. What are some of those requirements before people could qualify for both the training and the funding? To be an entrepreneur, all you have to have is an idea, as we always like to say. Have an idea because we take, we don't only take established businesses. We take businesses right from the infancy stage, the idea stage, the infancy stage, and then those who have done maybe two, three years, everybody's free to apply. We like to have a mix because we know it's not the different, different people and different needs. So we want to continue to support everyone. So just have that idea, apply, and we'll go through. We always have hundreds of applications. But the good thing is we don't even do the, um, the screening ourselves. We make sure we get you know, professional bodies to screen for us. I mean, we'll, all these will be revealed tomorrow. We'll have them present the in-depth study and analysis that they went through to be able to select so it's not that they go through, not even just went through, they go through to be able to select these entrepreneurs. So they go through and they select these entrepreneurs. So anybody can apply, anybody at all. We always like to tell ourselves, both in the fact that we don't know these people, they don't know us, we don't know the people that are selected. Apply, just have your idea, have your, um, your plan, apply, and then you can be selected. And more or less the same thing for the mentors. We just want people who are interested in helping. Again, we go through, we have our uh, professionals, Accenture, 
so who you know it used to be Accenture who help us you know go through this professionally so that it's not us at the foundation but we have a third party who goes through professionally and selects the both the um, the applicants the, being the entrepreneurs or the mentees as you refer to them and the mentors. Mm. All right, so I guess we'll have to wait for, it's less than 24 hours tomorrow. We'll get more on the announcement and the details uh, for this, uh, uh, for the 10th uh, uh, year of the program. Yes, yeah, definitely. Tomorrow, tomorrow, that's when we hope to release the list of the cohorts. Tomorrow, as you said, <coughs> excuse me, I think you had mentioned that it was 1,200. We always say 1,000 is our commitment, but we always try to do a bit more through support of other people. So 1,200 tomorrow, the names will be released. And um, and then we'll start the journey with them, with the training and even going beyond the, 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 the immediate training period when they now become the alumni, as I said, of the foundation. All right, Dr. Awele Lumelu, we wish you the best tomorrow. And of course, we wish uh, the mentees also the very best. All right, thank you very much. All right, so it's almost time. I'll just tell you that the NGX dropped again yesterday, but we are still on the 104,000 level. So we'll get details at 1 p.m. during Business Incorporated. Ladi and Will Ibong will be here to give you the full gist. Back now to the Sunrise Daily Studio. Some of these are happening. We have seen what has happened in uh, in Kaduna, in Maiduguri, uh, in Bornose, rather, and then in Sokoto. Mr. President has said that this is an unacceptable situation. Um, he is not going to. Uh, the government will not condone uh, abductions or kidnappings or any kind of uh, criminality in that direction. We are seeing, of course, this happen, and government is taking very proactive steps first to mitigate that and also to stop the spread of uh, the, this, this apparent, you know, we are seeing some kind of uh, uh, movement by, the, the more the security agencies are also hitting these targets, uh, the, the targets of criminals, the more they are, they are pushed to also getting some uh, soft targets. But government is not taking any excuses. The, the president has directed that security agencies must, as a matter of urgency, ensure that these children and all those who have been kidnapped are brought back to, in safety and also in the process to ensure that not a dime is paid for uh, uh, ransom. Uh, welcome back from the business studios. And we go quickly into uh, this conversation around the security situation around the country, the recent kidnappings and uh, killings in the Delta, for instance. And joining us to look at this, we have Mr. Mikey Giofo, a former director with the Department of State Services. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Jofo, um, of course, there have been multiple reactions, all manner of reactions to, let's start out with the Delta situation, the, uh, like the most recent. But from your angle, what do you think? Well, for me, it's uh, something I can't imagine. The killing in Delta. You know, I try to figure out, killing people is not right. Nobody has any right take any other person's life, talk of soldiers, and going beyond killing, but mutilating their body and decapitating their, their head and all this. It's a uh, human. I've, for me, I think we have lost our values as human beings. No respect for life anymore. This is a very tragic incident for me. I can't comprehend it. It's just sad, very, very sad indeed. Mm. What do we make of the reactions that have trailed it so far? Because initially, I mean, there are those who, who said that, look, the, there wasn't a quick enough response uh, to, you know, that, to the incident. And this was said to have happened on a Friday. And uh, we didn't get a statement from 
Uh, I think her May headquarters responded perhaps late Saturday or early Sunday. It's unclear. I can't quite remember now. But by that time, um, human rights activist Mr. Femi Falana was already, you know, calling that you know there needs to be a quick response so as to douse tension, um, you know, between that community and you know the the larger Nigerian society. Because for some people, what immediately came to mind after that incident happened was the aftermath that had trailed such an incident in places like Odi and Zakibiam. And there were fears, immediate fears for, you know, that community that, look, this could, you know, spell doom for it, uh, given what had happened, what had transpired there. But from what you've seen so far, would you say that all the reactions that we have seen um, have been in line with what should happen um, in the wake of such a very, you know, disturbing incident? Well, for me, I don't think... Uh anybody would have stepped in to prevent what had happened. The, despite the denial by the military, it's usual with them for such reprisal attack. They will continue to say they did not. But then, who raised the community? And nobody knows the number of casualties, but we can see from uh, videos, you can see this, this, the place burning up to the extent that the governor had no access to the, nobody has a, media and journalists have no access to the community. So that's going too far. We sympathize with the military. Nigerians have money that our military, have, but two wrongs don't make a right. And it follows the trend that each time the military is killed, to go for reprisal. Uh, much as we discourage people from taking laws into their hands by killing our military, because it's a symbol of our authority. Mm. The military should not also go beyond their mandate of burning the people. Now, let's look at it this way. How, what took the military to that community? They said they went for peace, peace, uh, Keeping. peacekeeping. Peacekeeping between who and who? If there's a peacekeeping, two parties must be involved. People from the two communities must be involved. And possibly a neutral ground will be taken. Possibly the local government uh, headquarters, if we are talking of uh, peace initiatives. And why must the military? In fact, the military exposes itself to harm's way. We don't blame the dead, but the people behind such mission. If the, the police, the SSS, and the, the military were involved in this, I don't think we'd have seen this type of uh, incident. Why not justifying the killings? But I think it is a lesson for all of us and for the military. You know, you don't blame the military too much because they have been so much involved in civil matters that you now, the military will now go for peace initiative without the civil authority, which is, of course, the police. I, 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 still, I still don't get it. Mm. So you do believe that there needs to be a thorough investigation? Of course, the... of course. And I think that's part of what I'm asking. When I asked that question about reactions and the aftermath of what had happened, you know, statements that were released, uh, we heard the CDS say that, you know, a thorough investigation was going to be, you know, undertaken into the incident that had happened. However, I do not know, I mean, because right now the military is an injured party, I mean, as, as well as all Nigerians are, uh, but the military specifically has felt the direct impact of this. Do you think that they are still in, the, in a prime position to be able to undertake such an investigation? The military is a party interested. They cannot take, undertake such investigation. And uh, I feel that by now, the federal government or the state government must have set up an investigative panel to look into this matter because time is, time is running. People are abandoned their communities. And no life is there. The military has taken over the community. And uh, it's, it's, I just can't understand why the delay in setting up uh, this investigative panel. We need to get to the root of that matter to know exactly what happened. I, I think many things are not adding up. Mm. How should we go about this? Because it doesn't appear that we've had precedents to follow. 
um, emotions are still very raw as expected. I mean, when you take into cognizance the manner in which this sort of incident happened uh, and the gruesomeness of it all, yeah. it is expected. Even Nigerians are wondering that what sort of audacity, you know, did, did the people who committed such, uh, you know, an attack, what, what F1 tree did they have? You know, so as such, even Nigerians are trying to come to term, uh, you know, with, with the manner of the attack. And as such, emotions are still raw and still very much high. However, given the fact that we do, we do not exactly have precedence in terms of how this has happened or what should happen uh, in a manner that is civil and also uh, respectful of not just the dead, but also of the community where this has happened. Because let's not forget that not everybody would have been you know, involved. exactly involved and also approving of what has, has transpired. How would you suggest, and we know that security agencies usually prefer well, the might, they understand might more than, you know, pr processes. What do you think ideally should have happened in the aftermath of such a report? Uh, um, what's talking of precedence? What happened during OD? Nothing, nothing came out of it. You talk of Zakibia, nothing came out of it. And it, 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 it's now following that same trend that people will go take laws into their hands. Two wrongs cannot make a right. Like I said, when we started, the gruesome murder of those and looking at mutilating their... I mean, we've lost our values, like I said before. It's, I, I still can't come to terms with that. But the military, too, out of emotion, has taken their pound of flesh by raising down the community, even though they say they didn't. Then, investigation will prove who uh, raised the community. Let us look at an independent body of inquiry. Which body to, would that be? The federal government or the state government should, at various levels, set up or they harmonize. The state government brings representative, the uh, federal government brings representative, and formed a very high-powered, independent investigation that will come out with an objective report of what happened. Because as it is now, people are scampering, influence. Some people that might be indicted in this uh, investigation mm. because the military, Lieutenant Colonel, major, two majors, cannot on their own just move out on a peacekeeping mission in a community. And the people are not. There's so much to this incident that must be found out. It's quite unfortunate that these officers who government has committed so much resources to train have lost their lives. No matter the amount of compensation, the national honor, national barrier, it will not bring back their lives. But we must learn a lesson from this, that in future, the military would also collaborate with the civil authority, especially the police, the state security service, and the other agencies that are working together to ensure peace. You know, Mr. Jeffo, there's that conversation about the fact that the civil, the civil military relations have been strained, so to speak, maybe because the, mil the military is really stretched across different, um, different facets of the country, carrying out um, security, trying to secure the country, contrary to what they are meant to do, which is protecting the borders, as the case may be. But when you say the military needs to relate more, carry out more civil relations, what exactly would you want them, the military to do? Well, until this uh, ugly incident, I know that uh, Major General, who is in charge of uh, civil military relationship, they, they, they have been... You know, there's been improved relationship between the military and the civil authorities. Uh, but this incident has just set us back many years because there is great suspicion now. In fact, the whole of uh, the South South, the grave implications of what is going on now. Because people are apprehensive. They are looking for the culprits mm. who are responsible for this. And in the process, some innocent people can be arrested. Some people can even lose their lives in the process. So we need to build this confidence between the military and the civilians. 
to give say, reassurance. And there's no way this can be better done than looking at the truth, finding out exactly what happened so that uh, in future, such uh, situations can be prevented mm. from happening. You know, you know, yeah, we're seeing the, the reports that the troops are coming by Elsa and Delta Creeks to Rivers. find uh, these militant leaders. But while we were, were talking about this, the other matter in Kaduna also comes to mind. 287 children kidnapped, another six, another 87, another 15 in different areas. And yesterday, the Kaduna state government sat down for a, an emergency security meeting from which they rose from. And the governor was quoted as saying to the... He said he told the traditional rulers to fish out the informants of the bandits. In his words, there are some people, some unscrupulous people who have crept into the various communities who are informing the bandits about activities going on. The bandits, they are watching television. Mm. Mr. Jaffa, I'm going to have to interrupt you very briefly. <laughs> Uh, this is just to inform our viewers on our DSTV platform that we'll be going live to Bolche State for the distribution, for live coverage of the distribution of palliatives organized by the state government. Um, this program, Sunrise Daily, will certainly continue on all our other platforms, including our online platforms. But we're taking you live now, our viewers on DSTV, to Bolche State for a live coverage of the distribution of palliatives organized by the state government. Come back to the conversation, Mr. This is a live channel's television event. Kika sa albarka. Allah mado kika albarka chi jamaramu. Wannan kuma bariya temiki gida jamu iya lamu. Wannan halin jin kai kuma baramu ma cikin yanayin zama zamantakewar mu da yan uwa mu ma mu nuna jin kai ga yan uwan mu Allah madaukaki ka sa albarka akan wannan hidima ka albarkaci duk wanda suka kawo wadannan gudumawa da shawarwari da aka yi musamman a cikin jihar Bauchi domin yin wannan ayyuka ubangiji ka sa mana albarka ka kiyaye mu cikin sunan Yesu almasihu ubangijin mu cikin sunan uba da na da da ruhu mai sarki Well, thank you so much. I'm <laughs> 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 Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala nabiyil karim Your Excellency our honorable governor the good governor of the good people of Bauchi state the chairman PDP governors forum the waziri of das the Triki of Ninji, the Sadawji of Jamare, the Danjika of Misau, the Jagaba of Katagum, the Kaura of Bauchi and Kauran Dawlar Usmania. Distinguished Senator Bala Abdul Qadir Muhammad C.O.N. Your Excellency, the Right Honourable Speaker, Bauchi State House of Assembly, aptly represented by His Excellency, the Right Honourable Deputy Speaker, Bauchi State House of Assembly, Right Honourable Jamilu Umaru Nairu Baradi, the Chief Judge of Bauchi State, Justice Rabi Talatu Umar, the Honorable Grand Cadi, Bochi State, Honorable Omar Ahmed Liman Walen Zungur, the State Chairman of the Governing Party in Bochi State, the Chairman PDP, Honorable Hamza Koshe Akwiam Banagang Misau, 
with the ESCO of the PDP here present, the Chairman Ramadan Palliative Distribution Committee, who happens to be the acting SSG and the Chief of Staff, Government House, Bauchi State, Dr. Aminu Hassan Gamawa, our father, His Royal Highness, the Chairman, Council of Emirs, Bauchi State, His Royal Highness, Alaji Dr. Rilwanu Suleimanu Adamu, CFR, Sarkin Yakin Daular Osmania. The Principal Private Secretary to the Governor of Bauchi State, Honorable Commissioners and Special Advisors to His Excellency, with a special recognition to the host Commissioner, the Honorable Commissioner, Ministry of Humanitarian, Bauchi State, permanent secretaries of various MDAs here present, local government, Kiatika Committee Chairman here present, elders of the party with due apology, the head of civil service, Bauchi State, distinguished invited guests, Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, let me use this medium to welcome each and every one of us to the official luncheon ceremony of the 2004 Ramadan Palliative Distribution, which was initiated by your administration to bring circle within the communities of Bauchi State during the Ramadan. Your Excellency, Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to make this announcement that whatever we are transmitting here is being transmitted live by channel television and all our radio station here in Bauchi. For that reason, we'll be mixing the moderation both in English and Hausa so that our target audience that were at home, they were not able to be here in the studio, stadium, will go along with us, Your Excellency. Mekinwa Governor Jar Bauchi, Saudama Nyambaki, Jama Mada Damata, Yauranache, Mohimia, and the Mekinwa Governor, Zeka Damat Dabata Telepi, Nawata Ramalana, Watame Albarka, Mekinwa Governor Abitro de Wanansari, Yedda Wanansari, Ze Rasa, Jahar Bauchi, Tunda Gajaha, Izua Karamaru Kuma, Izua Ward Ward, Har izua mazabu de muke de suwa to polling units. Megin ma gamna, in kata samma yeng aichin kata mamba ka ide wasa. Yau kata marwache wad de da aita, wad de daga yau, ya nuna kanche wada a chika bada bada wada nanka eiki, a dukkan wurin da abin ye chafa. Yau a kata mar hukuma de bauchi, da da ka kata mar. Bauchi tana da ward guda 20 amma ward 15 ne wadda aka kawo kayan su a nan a hakan ma rabin kayan su ne saboda wurin ba zai dauki kayan ba me girma gamna wannan na nuni da cewa kai shiri yadda al'umma za su samu sauki za mu bi da al'umma su ji ko wace karamar hukuma Abin da ke musu tanadi bisa kan wannan tsari na samar da abinci a cikin wannan wata mai albarka karamar hukumar alƙaleri wacce take da polling units dai 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 guda 300 mai girma gamna ya bada gero buhu dubu daya da 200 ya bada shinkafa buhu 600 Ya ba da masara buhu dubu daya da 800 ya ba da suga buhu 300 wa karamar hukumar alƙaleri in ka hada jimlatan karamar hukumar alƙaleri za ta samu buhu dubu uku da 900 daga mai girma gamna mai girma gamna karamar hukumar Bauchi da take da wasu guda 20 polling units 800 da Chase in the hudu, kaba the jero, dubu uku, the daribiar, the sabain the shida, 
Kaba su shinkafa 1788. Kaba da masara buhu 5364. Kaba da suka buhu 894. Jimlatan Watts na karamar hukumar Bauchi za su samu buhu 1111 daga mai girma gwamna. Mai girma gwamna karamar hukumar Bagoro wanda take da Watts dai 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 guda 13 ka bada gero buhu 476 ka ba su shinkafa buhu 238 ka ba su masara buhu 714 ka ba su suka buhu 119 karamar hukumar Bagoro za ta samu buhu 1547 Mai girma gwamna karamar hukumar Dambam dake da Watt 121 ka ba da Gero buhu 484 shinkafa 242 masara 726 suka 121 Dambam za ta tashi da buhu 1573 Mai girma gwamna Karamar hukumar Darazau wanda take da Watt 100 polling units guda 234 Watt 111 ka ba da Gero 936 shinkafa 468 masara 1400 da za ta tashi da buhu 342 mai girma gwamna karamar hukumar DAS wanda take da Ward Goma polling unit polling unit 79 gero 316 shinkafa 358 masara 474 suka buhu 79 DAS za ta tashi da buhu 127 Mai girma gwamna karamar hukumar gamawa mai ward 11 polling unit 256 gero 124 shinkafa 512 masara 236 suka 256 jimlatan gamawa za ta tashi da buhu 328 Mai girma gwamna Karamar hukumar Ganjuwa mai ward 11 polling unit 266 Gero 864 shinkafa 432 masara 1496 suka 2292 jimlatan Ganjuwa za ta tashi da buhu 2484 mai girma gwamna Karamar hukumar giya ne mai ward 11 polling unit 321 Gero 484 shinkafa 242 masara 728 suka 121 giya ne za ta tashi da buhu 1473 Mai girma gwamnati karamar hukumar jama'are mai ward goma Polling unit 105 Gero 420 Shinkafa 210 Masara 630 Suga 105 Jimlatan 1465 Karamar hukumar Itas Gadau mai ward goma unit 398 Gero 792 Shinkafa 396 Masara dubu daya da 188 suka 198 itas gadau za ta tashi da buhu 2574 mai girma gwamna karamar hukumar Katago mai ward 111 polling unit 274 gero buhu daya dubu daya da 96 shinkafa 248 masara dubu daya 144 suka 276 
katakun za ta tashi da 3562 Me girma gamna karamar hukuma ta kirfi wacce take da polling unit 132 ta samu gero 128 shinkafa 264 masara 792 suga 132 jimlatan karamar hukumar kirfi buhu 